Knights, good morning. Welcome to Friday of week five. So yesterday was Shuttle Boy's ninth birthday. He was born in 1998, so uh, hence the cupcakes. Um, some of you may have realized so that we'd have enough quantity. Uh, some Twinkies might have slipped in there too, but uh, otherwise help yourselves on your way out as well. So how many of you have maybe spent the past few moments staring at this thing, maybe crossing your eyes just a little bit, hoping that some magic eye kind of thing is gonna pop out? Yeah, okay, it's not one of those. So, <laughs> but there is something hidden in there. So Problem Set 4, which will be released tonight, even though PS3 is due tomorrow, uh, is quite fun, I think. Among the challenges it poses to you is to give you this image, which is a BMP file, a bitmap file. And somewhere hidden in there is a, a, the answer to a murder mystery. And only by writing a piece of software that's going to decode this thing will you be able to unravel that mystery. So, um, it's not one of those magic eye puzzles, but if you ever had as a kid one of those little plastic pieces of like red, red plastic that you could hold in front of a message like this, it would then reveal to you the answer. So that's essentially the idea that we've implemented here in software. So if you still have your little 3D glasses, those two might work on a puzzle like this. But take a look at the spec when it's released for more on that. Uh, all right, any questions before we move ahead? All right, in an English sentence, what's a pointer? And we seem to have a few parents in the audience today, so you better impress. What's a pointer? What's a pointer? So this is actually pretty meaningless, because parents, watch this. What's a cupcake? <laughs> See, so you get nothing with that either. So, all right, so a pointer, I'll get you started. So, a pointer is an address in memory. All right, so why, how about let's ask it in a more interesting question. Why are pointers a potentially dangerous feature of a language like C? What can you do with these things that perhaps isn't such a good thing? Yeah. Yeah, so you can read from or even write to, even worse, memory that is not yours, so to speak, memory that doesn't belong to you. And later in the semester, we're actually going to come back to this topic in our secure coding lecture, where we'll look quite specifically at something called the buffer overflow exploit, which I've mentioned a few times already, but we'll actually see mechanically how something like that is achieved and how you can, in fact, take over a system simply by exploiting some programmer's mistake with regard to pointers. So one other piece of functionality that's useful to know when it comes to pointers. This file here is pointers1.c. Uh, it's among your handouts from this week, among your printouts. And this demonstrates something called pointer arithmetic. So we know from Wednesday that there's sort of this equivalence between pointers and arrays, whereby you can access an array's elements using that square bracket notation. But we've also seen that you can actually get at some of the contents via pointer notation using the dereference operator, the star operator. Well, it turns out that we can take that one step further. And you don't need to be totally comfortable with this just yet, because we'll see it again. But know that we can do the following. So this program, pointers1, in this blinking line, clearly gets a string from the user. We're then doing a sanity check saying if s equals equals null, just return immediately. And get string recall can return null if something goes wrong with get string. What's one thing that could go wrong in the process of getting a string from the user? Yeah. Sure, so if that user hammers on the keyboard for quite some time and types in way too many characters, well, our get string function, as we'll see today, isn't going to be able to handle that. And rather than turn just part, return part of that string, it's going to return none of it at all. And it's instead going to return null. But assuming everything goes OK, clearly the comments suggest that we're going to print this string one character per line. But what's interesting for now is how we're doing this. So typically, if you wanted to print out the ith character of a string called s, what would you write? printf of you know, percent %c comma what? s bracket i, right? Pretty straightforward. Been doing that for a few weeks now. Well, it turns out that you can also do this via the pointer that really is s. So recall that string is just synonymous with char star. So that's why I've written today the string s is really typed to be a char star. But now notice a few lines down from where my cursor is here, notice that what I'm printing is indeed a character. But what's going on with star parenthesis s plus 1? I mean, that 2 will work. But take a guess as to why. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So remember that star s is whatever's at the location that s is pointing at. And so for the zeroth character in the array, well, star s is literally the first character in the string. But if you want to then get at the next character and the next character, you need to do an offset. So plus one, plus one, plus one. So what I'm simply doing here is simply saying star of the address s plus this offset, go get what's at that memory location. And so the compiler goes ahead and essentially treats that as, you know, as though you were accessing this thing via an array. And in fact, it actually works the other way around. This bracket notation that you guys have been using thus far, I mean, what the compiler really is doing is translating that shorthand notation into this, which is a more accurate implementation of what's going on underneath the hood. Well, let's see it in one other context. In the file called pointers2.c, we have the same idea using pointer arithmetic. And the line got a little long here, given my font size. But take a look at the first line of code here. And this will perhaps make more clear uh, a discussion that was going on on the bulletin board recently. This first line of code in English does what? What does it do? Yep. Perfect. It declares an array, and it statically initializes it, so to speak, with those five numbers. So the nice trick here, if you haven't seen it before, is that if you're declaring an array and simultaneously giving it some values, you actually don't have to specify its size within the brackets. We could. In fact, if I really wanted to be anal and clear, I could say that. And that would be equivalent. But some of you, one of you noticed on the bulletin board, if you pull up this thread, if you haven't seen it yet, that this creates a problem. If you say, give me an array of size 4, but here are five numbers for it, well, you're going to get some kind of warning, most likely, from the compiler. And even if the thing does compile, you're probably going to what? What's going to happen? Yeah, so you're going to lose the last number that you've tried to provide. All right, so that's a bit of syntax. Now let's move on to the pointer stuff. So down here, Notice that I'm printing out, printing out first the size of the array is percent %d. So this is kind of cool. We've seen size of before, but thus far we've used size of to print the size of data types. All right, well, you can also use it to print out the size of a data structure, like an array, albeit with some exceptions. If I simply put size of numbers at the end of that line, what the compiler is going to do is figure out how many bytes does the whole array numbers take up and it's going to return that value. So that's just going to tell us how many bytes constitutes that array. The second line of code there, meanwhile, is printing out what instead? Well, obviously the size of each element. Now, that's an easy one, right? Just getting the ith character or the zeroth character of numbers or the zeroth integer in numbers, obviously it's going to be of what data type based on what we've seen? It's an int, so what should that return? Four, so it returns bytes, recall. So that value should be four. And then finally, one line of craziness here. In this loop, I'm initializing some variable i to zero. All right, that's old school. Now n equals size of numbers divided by size of numbers bracket zero. What's that doing? Yeah. Yeah, so it's dynamically figuring out how many different elements are in the array. Because if the first call size of numbers returns the size of the whole array in memory, so how many bytes it takes up divided by the size of just one of those things, well, that tells you mathematically how many different things there are in the array. But here's the gotcha. This works in the function in which you declared the array. If you start writing more complicated code that passes arrays around as parameters, that's not going to work. Because unlike Java, for those of you familiar, C does not remember how big an array is outside of the scope in which it was initially declared. Okay, so calling size of on an array that's been passed as a an argument to some function is not going to behave as such. So realize you can use this here, but not necessarily in all contexts. But finally, the last piece of magic. This last line here is printing each element in the array by a percent %d. And notice what's happening here. Star of numbers plus i. Well, what's numbers, to be clear? Be as technical as possible. And what is numbers? Pointer. Perfect. It's the, a pointer to the first element in an array. And that element happens to be an int, because the pointer itself was declared as a pointer to an int. Right Now, that's not totally obvious, but recall the equivalence of these things. Right? That's essentially what we're seeing there as well. All right, so back to the original. Why? There's an interesting issue here, though. So in this example, we're doing numbers plus i and doing essentially plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. But numbers is an address. 
And we have ints in this array. So what should happen if you take the starting address of that array and then just add 1? So take the address plus 1. Are you going to, in fact, get the second element in the array? Thinking about how big is an int, though? You miss a? Misaligned. So that seems to be a little dangerous here, right? If these are ints and I know these things are of size 4, don't I really want to be doing this? So i is incrementing by 1 each time, right? Because of the i plus plus that's wrapping around onto the long line there. So don't I actually want to be doing plus 4 each time, essentially? So i times 4, not just plus i. Okay, so it's a perfect observation. Turns out the compiler fixes that for you. So the nice thing about this so-called pointer arithmetic is that the compiler figures out the size of the data type to which you're applying this plus operator. And in this case, it would actually add the numeric value 4, even though visually it looks like you're just adding plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. So enough on that for now, but just tuck that away as a feature that we'll likely revisit. But are there any questions? on what's just happened. If anything, at this point, it hopefully makes a little more clear exactly what is, in fact, going on underneath the hood. Yeah. All right, so as promised, we can finally now take a look inside of CS50's library. So this is something you've been using for quite some time. Some of you have already sort of ditched these training wheels, so to speak, and begun implementing user input your, on your own. Frankly, there's no reason not to continue using CS50's library for user input throughout the rest of the semester. Um, it, makes much more, much easier a process that C does not, out of the box, make very accessible, getting input from the user. But let's actually use this as an interesting opportunity to at least see what's been going on with some of these functions. So this recall is CS50.h. And recall, we saw this weeks ago. So we're declaring a Boolean data type using this syntax called enum, which allows you to uh, declare a bunch of variables in between those curly braces. And the way enum works for future reference, though you haven't had to use this in problem sets yet, is that enum assigns automatically the values 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, then 4 to any of the uh, tokens that you put in between the curly braces. So that is to say, what does false actually equal in reality, 0. And true is 1. So it's a nice uh, piece of syntax to save me the trouble of actually assigning that explicitly. Me here, meanwhile, is our synonym. Get char is implemented with this declaration, is rather defined with this declaration. There's get double. There's get float. I mean, there's really not much going on inside this header file. But to be clear, why have you guys been including, sharp including, this file for all these weeks? I mean, what's the point of doing that in the first place? Well, think about those function prototypes that you guys have been writing yourselves for some of your functions. What happens if you, when writing a program like 15 that has multiple functions, or any program you've written yourself thus far that has multiple functions, if you don't either put the function itself above main, or equivalently you forget to declare where the prototype that function above main? What happens? What's that? Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So GCC yells at you and says implicit declaration of function something or other, right? And you can fix that by adding the prototype or just moving your functions around. Well, the way sharp include works is literally like a copy paste. Anytime you've had atop your file a line like uh, sharp include, in this case, cs50.h, what this is literally doing is taking the contents of cs50.h and pasting them into this C file so that when GCC then compiles this file, it has not only all the stuff you wrote, but the contents from cs50.h as well, thereby giving you sort of automatically all of those function prototypes at the top of your file. So that's what's been going on there. And even in problem set three or four, you'll see us increasingly using header files to sort of factor out function prototypes and maybe data structure declarations just so that we can start organizing what are increasingly large files more effectively. So this is now the C file. Let's scroll down to get int, since that's perhaps one of the most common ones you guys have used. So here is get int's implementation in CS50's library. And most of you probably haven't seen this before. So get int returns an int. That's pretty easy. Takes no arguments. We knew that. All right, what next happens? Well, I've declared a few variables atop this file. And then I appear to have this infinite loop. So hopefully, there's actually a break statement somewhere in here that actually gets me out of this. Well, what do we do? 
Well, we actually within getInt call our own getString. Just because we already spent all this time writing getString, which gets a whole line of text from the user, why not leverage the code we've already written? Well, the next line is doing this sanity check. If for some reason getString flakes out and doesn't return to us a valid string, well, getInt shouldn't return a value as well. And there's a tricky thing here. What typically has been the value we return when there's some error in a function? Yeah, like one, maybe negative one, two, you know, anything other than zero. The problem, though, with doing that, with implementing a function called getInt, is what? I mean, those are integers, right? And those are very reasonable numbers for the user to be able to type into your program. So you need a sort of special value. And arbitrarily, we decided to return this constant called int max, which is defined in one of those other header files, which really is the biggest possible int possible. So we are sacrificing essentially the value 2 to the uh, 31 minus 1. You physically can't use that number in your program because we're using that as a special marker to indicate that a problem happened. So maybe not ideal that we're wasting a value, but at least now we, the user, by checking for that return value, by checking if get int returns int max, which is again just a constant, you can at least check for yourself did something go wrong, rather than just in confusing return one with a valid number potentially. Now here's the magic of get int. This is all there is to it. We've seen this scanf function on Wednesday. Uh, scanf, or rather we saw scanf, this is s scanf, but what did scanf do? Do you recall? Yeah, it gets a line of input from the user, and you tell scanf what type of data to expect. So for now, just assume this function is the same. What I'm doing is I'm saying to this function, all right, expect on the line you're given an integer and then maybe some character. Now, that's a little strange, but let's see what's going on. This syntax here, so n, recall, is an int defined up here, and c is a char. Why am I passing to this function scanf or s scanf? ampersand n and ampersand c. Again, think back to Wednesday. Yeah, so it's the address of operator. And why is it crucial to pass the address of these variables to scanf rather than just n and c? So that you pass by reference, but again, who cares? So it knows where to look. And more importantly, it knows where to put the values that the user typed in. Right? It's the same issue with those swap functions that we looked at a few weeks ago that was just broken. Right? When you pass by value, you don't have the ability to change a variable's value. If you pass by address, aka by reference, you do have that ability. And it, really, it boils down to that same idea. So this bit of trickery here is just so that we can detect errors. So ideally, the string that the user has typed, which is called line, is going to contain ideally just an int. And so we use percent %d so that scanf looks at that string, says, here's the first int I find. I'm going to put it into n for you. But we also wanted to be able to do some error checking. So if the user screws up and types in the number 5 space foo, just because. We don't want to just return 5, because maybe we want to be able to detect that the user was messing around and did not provide just an int. So the trick that we're using, and this is a more, say, sophisticated use of this function, is we're declaring that scanf should also potentially expect percent %c. Why are we doing that? I mean, given the, the goal that I just had in mind, what's going to happen if the user does type in 5 space foo as opposed to just 5? So scanf will return. OK, true, but let's ignore return values for a moment, focusing just on why I'm specifying both percent %d and percent %c. Or push. So that you can tell, but how? What's going to happen if the user also typed in foo after the number 5? Exactly. So the character f, if the user has messed around like that and typed in not only an int, but some character or characters, the first of those characters is going to end up in percent %c, or rather the variable that that's meaning, which is the variable c. And it turns out that scanf and scanf return to you, the caller, the total number of variables that were filled with values from the user. So the idea here is that if only one of those variables out of n and c was filled with a value, scanf is going to return 1. And that's a good thing. I'm going to go ahead and return the value n. But if any other number was captured, namely 2, 
something went wrong. And I'm going to bail, and I'm going to force the user with this last line of code to retry, retry, retry. And now here's one thing worth pointing out, but we'll again come back more to memory management in future problem sets. Get string, it turns out, all this time has been leaking memory, so to speak. Right? Get string, if it's going to return to you a string that the user's typed, we've been allocating space for that in RAM. But you've never been returning it to the operating system. You just keep getting string after string from the user. And you yourselves, odds are, have never freed that memory. Well, we've been more careful underneath the hood with, say, get int. If anything goes wrong, well, suppose the user types in the number uh, 5,000 at the prompt and hits enter. How many characters, presumably, did our get string implementation allocate for 5,000? Careful. 5. Why 5 for the value 5,000? So it's a null terminator, right? Because when the user types it, it's still a string. We've not done any kind of conversion. So 5, 0, 0, 0, backslash 0 is 5 total characters. So get string presumably, and if you look closely, does in fact allocate dynamically using what function? Just to tie everything together? Malloc. 5 bytes, 5 chars for that string. The problem is, if something ever goes wrong, we want our function to free up that memory. So know for today that the means by which you do that is simply calling free on whatever pointer is holding the address that malloc returned. OK, so any questions on get int? OK, you don't have to totally understand everything that's going on, but at least now you should be able to, uh, you should be able to pick up on how this library has been functioning all along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So excellent question. Where is the conversion from string 500 zero, zero, backslash 0 happening to the integer we know as 5,000? Well, it turns out that's one of the features of scanf and sscanf. So whereas for the Caesar cipher, most of you guys probably used A to I and manually converted things yourself, sscanf does that for you. And it does it en masse for a large, potentially, number. So that's happening there. And now, just to be clear, the difference between scanf and sscanf is that scanf reads its input from the keyboard. sscanf reads the input from a string, which is why I'm able to pass sscanf line rather than expecting the user to type something uh, else altogether. Any other questions? OK, so if you're curious and you kind of like understanding how some of this stuff's been working underneath the hood, by all means, check out the rest of the library. The path to it is on this particular slide. All right, so two final features, both of which you'll employ for problem set four. We promised a while back that you have this ability with C to declare your own data types, because the only data types you get out of the box are in char, float, double, char, star, all these pointers as well. But you don't get anything particularly interesting, anything particularly large. So suppose that you actually wanted to implement a program that somehow manages a database worth of students. Well, if you have a, this program, is, if it's supposed to work for, say, 20 different students, well, how could you go about declaring enough space in memory so that for each student you can store their ID number, their name, and their house? I mean, up until this point, what might you have to do? We know how to get a big chunk of memory. So what could we do if we wanted to store all of the user's ID numbers? Yeah, so in an array, so int, let's call it IDs, and we'll call it size 20. Or we could figure it out dynamically. But if we also want to keep around every student's name, we're also going to need to do something like string names bracket 20. And even that is just really the pointers to those strings. We haven't even actually allocated space for the strings themselves. But then finally, for houses, we could do this. So the problem, though, with this approach is that there's no inherent linking of each of these data structures together. I mean, you yourself can just infer or can just assume that IDs 0 is the first student's ID, and names 0 is the first student's name, and houses 0 is the first student's house, and repeat for all of the other students. But this very quickly becomes unwieldy, particularly because, I mean, this does not scale very well for a database that has more fields than just ID, name, and house. And you can imagine how much data FAS maintains on each of you in its database. Well, structs are the answer. We now have the ability to define your own data structure. And you can plop in this structure any primitives or even any other data structures that you want. The syntax to, uh, is as simply. 
is simply the following. You specify type def struct, and then in between the curly braces, you enumerate all the different fields that you want this new data structure to have. In this case, an ID, a name, and a house. And then outside the curly brace, you specify the name that you want to give this structure. And henceforth, what I'm now able to do is to declare 20 students in memory. I can get away with declaring. That. And that just did in one fell swoop what I was enumerating line by line by line separately. Moreover, inside of each of t h i s a r r a y s elements is an entire structure for a student. But we need a piece of syntax. If I wanted to assign the first student an ID number, well, odds are we do that to access the zeroth student. And can't probably guess this, but for those of you who already know, what's the syntax for ask, accessing the zeroth student's ID number? Yeah, it's dot, right? And we'll see this in print in a moment. That piece of code accesses the zero, zeroth student's ID number. And then we can put it as, say, one, two, three, four. And that tucks away in the variable called ID, which is part of this structure. That particular number. We can go one step further and say students zero、uh, uh, dot name gets get string, right? And I'll just let, without doing any error checking, I'll just let the user type in the name, even though that might not necessarily be a safe thing if something goes wrong. All right, but let's take a look at this in action. So in structs one, we have the following code. So notice atop this file, I'm including structs.h. So already I'm sort of、uh, adhering to this principle of factoring out some code like data structures or other、uh, constants, except for this one, students, which is defined here as three.、Right? I just wanted a quick and dirty example, so I hard coded the value three as the value of students. All right, so this. Is declaring a class of students, so to speak.、Right? The goal of this program is to model all of the students in a class. It's a small class, only three students, but that is equivalent to what I just did here for, of course, 20 students instead. Now, what am I doing here? Well, this thing's a, an array at the end of the day, this whole class, so I can just iterate over it. And for each of these students' IDs and names and houses, I can just ask the user to provide them. And then by the end of this loop, I have an array of three students, each of whose three members is populated with the three things the user typed in.、Right? So the code is very simple in concept. And the only piece of new、uh, syntax we're seeing is this so called dot notation and the ability to declare the struct in the first place. In fact, notice that in structs.h is that data structure. So it's common practice, though not required, to put data structures in a header file, especially if it makes your code more readable, because it makes more obvious where some of your data structures are defined. And now, just for kicks, I needed an arbitrary example to illustrate the syntax. I wanted to print out any student who happens to live in Mather House.、Okay? So I'm iterating again over the array of students. And then what's this line of code presumably doing? Most of you probably haven't used this function before, but it's just it's documented in that website we keep referring you to, and it's pretty straightforward. Yeah? What's the house of the student? If the string itself is Mather,、mm-hmm. like all the same、uh, characters in the string, that's the string of the house. Exactly. Yeah, so if the value of the ith student's house, which is a string, is the same as quote unquote Mather, capital M A T H E R, Turns out that this function strcomp, if two strings are equal, returns zero because that means they are truly equal. If instead one is greater than or less than the other in terms of lexicographic order, that is dictionary order, it will return instead negative one if one belongs before the other or positive one if the other be- belongs after the other. So you can look at the documentation for specifics, but that's the idea. It does a comparison of the strings. Why couldn't I just do class of i.house equals equals mather? Yeah. Because there, the, the strings are actually referring to the pointers are referring to location in memory. Exactly. Exactly. We'd be comparing the pointer values, which is not the goal. We want to compare them things character for character. And then finally, notice what I'm doing in this last line as an evidence of good practice. Once you're done using memory that you have yourself allocated, which in this case you have because you called getString, which you now know does call malloc, we have to free every one of the strings. We don't need to free an int, 
because that's just a primitive. It wasn't allocated with malloc, but anything that's a string or dynamically allocated an array, you need to free up ultimately so that your system doesn't eventually run out of memory. Now, the bit of a white lie there is that when your program terminates, it frees up all of its memory anyway. So it's sort of a moot point for these simple examples. But I think I mentioned weeks ago, have any of you ever had the experience where you're running your computer without rebooting for maybe five days, a week, two weeks, and just gradually the damn thing's getting slower and slower and slower, even if you've quit all of your applications and nothing appears to be running? Well, one of the explanations for that is that whoever wrote one or more programs that at one point you were running during the week had memory leaks, where they called malloc or the equivalent again and again and again, and they never got around to calling free. And either because of that or because the operating system itself didn't properly terminate the process, it didn't free up that memory, your computer thinks it's out of RAM. It thinks RAM is filled with programs and data, even though none of it's in use anymore. So why does a reboot fix that? Well, it just restores the computer to its default state, which is where all of the most of the memory is free for you. All right, so let's run this just to make clear. So I'm going to run structs1. OK, compiled successfully. I'm going to run structs1. All right, student's ID. I'll give it a 1. We'll call him David Mather. All right, 2, Joe Quincy. 3, Jill Foho. OK, so David is in Mather. So the code does appear to work. But let's see if we can break it. So student's ID will be 1. You know, I'm not even going to bother typing a name. I don't have time for this. Instead, I'm going to pretend like I typed nothing. And as you saw, I think in problem set three, if you hit control D, that's like saying end of file to a program. So those of you who have worked on problem set three, um, um, 15 with our test inputs, three, x3 dot whatever and 4x4 dot whatever, and you were piping those files into your input, well, the only way the program knows that those files are ended is because the very last thing that happens when you send one file as input to another program is the last line essentially triggers this special character, EOF, that here's the end of the file. You as a user can mimic that same idea and pretend like the file that's feeding this program is done by hitting Control D. And notice what happens. If I hit Control D, it's just proceeding, but then breaking, right? Because what did I never have throughout my program? I never mentioned null, and in particular, I never checked for null. I got lazy with this example and didn't check the return values of get string, right? In structs one, recall that what I was doing constantly was making this leap of faith and just assuming whatever the user typed got put into the array and got returned by, by its address. But again, that might not be the case. Mm -hmm. Ah, good question. So let's run it. So structs one, one, uh, David, Mather, okay, two, uh, Joe, Quincy. Eh, doesn't all right. Doesn't doesn't really matter. So apparently no one's in Mather this time because it's not case insensitive. So if you wanted to do that, then you need to either implement yourself the idea of lower casing the string or upper casing the string to fix things or calling a library function that might do that for you. Stir to upper, stir to lower. I think you've seen some of those in the string library, even if you haven't used them. All right, so now a cool feature. And this one's going to be very useful for problem set four, which obviously is going to have you decoding what's in that sort of non-magic eye puzzle. And there's also a second piece, recall, to problem set four. In fact, I went around campus earlier this week with an expert photography friend. We had a gigabyte compact flash card and his nice digital camera. And we took photographs of identifiable but non-obvious locations on campus. Um, they're all on here. Unfortunately, I'm an idiot, and I formatted the thing. Uh, so your task for problem set four, besides that non-magic eye puzzle, is to recover as many of the photos on this compact flash card as you can. I haven't retaken photos using this same card, so hopefully the bits that com constitute all of my photos are, in fact, still on this thing. Since obviously there's one of these and 300 of you, you're not physically going to get this. But what we did was make a forensic copy of this compact flash card so that what you will get is a big file file on nice.fast that's identical to the contents of this compact flashcard as they are now. In that way, can you then poke around the insides of this file and recover as many JPEGs as possible? And uh, the icing on the cake there, so to speak, 
for that part of the problem set is that you'll have an extra week after submission time to, with zero or more other students in your section, locate as many of those locations that we shot on campus, take a photo of yourself or someone in your section with your camera phone or your digital camera, email it to a certain address, and the section that identifies most of the photographs on the compact flashcard will have a nice night out in the town uh, with your teaching fellow some evening soon. So there, there's the fun challenge. So how do we get there? Well, we need to be able to manipulate files. So file I.O. is actually all not, not all that complicated. Thus far, anytime you've been getting input from the user, essentially C treats the keyboard as a file called standard in or standard inputs. You don't often see this written because it's just assumed. But similarly, when you print something to the screen, C essentially behaves like you're printing to a file. That file just happens to be called standard out uh, or STD out or standard output. That is just in a sort of imaginary file whose destination isn't the printer, it isn't the disk itself, but it's the screen. So thus far, you've essentially been familiar with these concepts, but there are functions that specifically let you name files and open files from the local hard drive or from nice.fast. So let's take a look now at structs uh, 2. Dot C. Notice that this thing, too, also makes use of structs.h. So structs.h, again, defines a student structure. The goal of this program now is to have whatever data I provide persist after the program ends. Thus far, most, if not all of you, have written programs that the moment they quit, any work that the program did, any data that it created, is lost because you didn't save it anywhere. And RAM's contents, obviously, are ephemeral. They disappear effectively when your program quits. Not if you have access to file I.O. I.O. meaning input, output. If you have the ability to write to disk, obviously your data can persist. So how do we do this? Well, the top of this file is identical to before. I'm just iterating over the class, and I'm getting an ID, a name, and a house for each student. And again, I'm being lazy and not checking for null for this purpose. Now I'm going to go ahead and print out anyone in Mather. So that code is identical. But I'm going to go ahead now and save these students that have been provided to disk, just so that later I can read them in, or at least I can reference it as though this were a database that I'm accumulating on disk. Well, how do we do this? Well, the first line of code that's relevant is this blinking one. And notice that we couldn't really express file I.O. until we got to pointers for this reason. When you call the function fopen, you first pass to it the name of the file you'd like to open. And then you pass a string that represents the mode that you'd like to open it in. And popular modes are going to be w for write or R for read. So in this case, I'm obviously writing a file called database for writing. And because I didn't specify any slashes, any path, it's going to assume my current working directory, wherever I am. So maybe your PS4 directory. Okay. The next line of code is more important these days than ever, because I do need to check the return value of fopen as to whether it's null. Because if it is null, that means something went wrong. Maybe the, uh, there's no space left on the system. Maybe I can't overwrite a file that's still there. Or maybe I just don't have permissions to write to the directory I am in because I maybe CD'd to someone else's directory and I don't have write access there. Whatever the case, you need to check for this. But assuming it's not null, that is FP, file pointer, the convention here, is a pointer to essentially that file, not so much on disk, but in memory currently, because fopen sort of gives you access to that file in RAM effectively. But what I'm going to do now is iterate over my class. And I'm just going to print every field from the student objects into that file. Not using printf, but using fprintf, which is different only in that the first argument has to be a pointer to the file that you want to write to. But notice, if I instead change this to standard out, that would be equivalent to writing that. So that's why this isn't all that dissimilar to what you've been doing thus far. Finally, I get down here. I call fclose on the pointer, which closes the file, which means I'm done. It's like quitting Microsoft Word when you have a file open. Now I go ahead and free memory as before. So the only new code here are these lines here, which I'd argue are pretty straightforward once you understand that they exist and what they're supposed to do. And ideally now, in my current directory, I should have a file called database that has all of those uh, strings. So let's run it. So make structs2. We'll run structs2. All right, students ID, David, Mather, Stu. Oh, okay. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. Get used to typing mail in a lot, so that's what happens. Jill will be in Quincy, 
three will be uh, Jack this time and Foho. Oh. OK, so no one's in Mather. Um, <laughs> nothing appears to have happened, but if I do an ls, there's a lot of stuff in here. But notice that there is now a new file called database. So I'm going to go ahead and open that with nano. And notice that inside of this file is, line by line, all of the data that the user provided. Now, this, isn't, this sort of doesn't get the whole job done, because I don't seem to have any program in here, and I don't, that actually reads this data in. But it turns out you can do that as well. In fact, just like there's sscanf and scanf, get else, get, uh, guess what else also exists? fscanf, which allows you to read from a file line by line. Now, here's an interesting thing to note. We've just written out a so-called ASCII file, a text file. Your problem set three is going to involve binary files, the difference being that ASCII files are characters, alphabetical characters, numeric characters, punctuation. Binary files underneath it all are just zeros and ones. So the syntax will be slightly different uh, in terms of the mode that you need to open the file in. You'll open it in binary mode as opposed to the default ASCII mode, but the spec will uh, walk you through that. And now the domain in which you'll be playing for problem set four. So perhaps the coolest job I've ever had before this one was uh, Working while I was a grad student for a few months as a forensic investigator for the Middlesex County DA's office. And my research in grad school was predominantly in security. And so this job was essentially um, involved working with their full time forensic investigator just down the road near Leachmere, is where the DA's office is. And the job for me and for my mentor was to receive on a daily or weekly basis hard drives and flash media and other hardware that the Mass State Police or local sheriffs had um, confiscated during executions of search warrants. They would dump these things off in the office and typically say, find evidence on this media. What was kind of funny was that, and they were wonderful people to work with, but sometimes what would also be dropped off is things like mice and monitors. And there's really not all that much evidence inside of a mouse <laughs> or a monitor. <laughs> but that was OK. We just we had a big storage area. But one of the <laughs> But it was fascinating work, because literally we would be writing tools or using tools to unearth on people's hard drives files that they hoped were no longer there, files that they had deleted. Um, because the funny thing is about computers, and most of you have probably heard this already, that when you delete a file by dragging it to your recycle bin or the so-called trash can, and then even empty recycle bin or trash can, what happens? Uh, yeah, I mean. It's still on the hard drive, so in short, not much at all happens when you delete a file. In fact, the fact that I formatted my compact flash card accidentally really means nothing, because even formatting a flash drive or formatting a whole hard drive rarely means eliminating the data. It typically means writing a few bytes, a few kilobytes worth of data structures to the very front of the hard drive, the very beginning of the hard drive or flash media, just to sort of lay the foundation for what's called a file system, like NTFS or, uh, or FAT32 or HFS, if you're familiar with those acronyms. So the rest of the data is still kind of there. So effectively, what happens when you start saving files to a disk, and this is sort of file systems, or CS161 in a nutshell, um, you have these things called um, file allocation tables, FATs, and also directories. In fact, a directory, as you all know it, a folder that you double click on your hard drive and such, it looks like a folder. It looks like a directory. But what that technically means is that that directory is implemented in memory as a table. So there is somewhere in RAM or somewhere on disk, essentially like an Excel spreadsheet that has at least two columns, the first of which specifies a file's name, the second of which specifies a file's location on disk. So if you have a file like your resume somewhere on your system, Aesthetically, it looks like it's in this nice, pretty, double-clickable folder. But what that folder really represents is something like this. And underneath the hood, it's saying that resume.doc, if it's in this directory, is actually at location ffeb8 something. Not in RAM, but on disk. So you have this directory that maps file names to addresses, file names to addresses. If we have another file like uh, essay, dot doc, and this might be at OXFFAA32, uh, somewhere completely different. Moreover, it's even possible for your files to be spread out among lo multiple locations. Right? Imagine a scenario where over the course of a week or a year, you're saving lots of files. Well, then you delete some of the files, 
in the middle, so to speak, of some of those other files, and then you save some new files. Well, your operating system, Mac OS, Windows, and whatnot, are going to try to use that available space. So sometimes to fit your files into your hard drive or flash media, it will fragment them, putting parts in the free locations and then the rest wherever it can find space so that you're not wasting space. So again, in a nutshell, if any of you have ever been told to or have defragmented your hard drive, all it means is to make sure that all files are completely contiguous. You move their parts around so that all of their pieces are back to back to back. They'll also say, as today's CS50 lesson, it is of questionable performance value to bother defragmenting your hard drive. So if any IT guy ever tells you, go defragment your hard drive, odds are that's not going to fix much of anything. There are other bottlenecks in computers today. And hard drives are, my god, 200 gigabytes, 400 gigabytes. Fragmentation of files is not as much of an issue these days. But Enough on that. When you drag sa.doc to the recycle bin and empty the recycle bin, what happens? The file is no longer associated with the location, which just means that this goes away. But guess what? On disk, which I'll represent as one of those platters from, say, day zero of week zero, this is still an address on disk. So somewhere on disk is OXFFAA32. And let's say that it's this part of the disk. So that's referring to this location on disk. And you have in here, obviously, a whole bunch of zeros and ones. Looks like a pizza slice, doesn't it? That's, that's kind of how it works. So what's, <laughs> what's actually happening when you delete a file? Nothing in this side of the world. The only thing that typically happens is that the directory entry gets deleted. So the computer forgets where the file is. But all those zeros and ones are still there. All those web pages you visited are still there. All those URLs you visited are still there, even when you empty your cache or empty uh, your recycle bin. So one of the challenges for problem set four is going to be ex to exploit this reality in today's file systems for compact flashcards and also for the real world hard drives and other such devices that all of my JPEGs, hopefully, are still on that compact flash card and ideally on your forensic image. And problem set four will empower you to go recover them for us. So with that said, we'll see you on Monday.